welcome everybody to the uh, Radio Frequency Identification and Near Field Communication, Chapter 11. Uh, at the end of this chapter, we're hoping that we're all going to be able to uh, define radio frequency uh, identification and NFC, list the components of an, RI, of an RF ID or NFC system, describe how the RF ID works, NFC works, look at the challenges and security considerations of RF ID, and NSC. Imagine that like you're 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 just making a quick stop at the local supermarket to pick up a few grocery items and as you enter the store, uh, you obtain a bag near the store and you walk through the aisles and you load the bag with products that you need. And when you're finished, you simply walk through an arch like structure where the cash register would have been and you exit the store. No need to stop and pay for products or even to show anyone which products you purchased. You just reach for your smartphone when it beeps and find the grocery store and just that just sent you a receipt by mail. Now, while driving back home, you stop at a self-serve gas station, fill up your tank. You reach for the smartphone again, activate an app, bring the phone near the front of the pump. <clears throat> the gas pump beeps, authorizes the purchase. When you're finished pumping and replace the, uh, the gas nozzle, your smartphone beeps again and displays the receipt for the fuel. Uh, arriving at home, you put your purchase in your refrigerator. It's, uh, display screen now outside your refrigerator door is automatically updated with the contents, the expiration dates of each individual product, quantities, everything that you purchased, and and uh, this is an example of where RFID and NFC can actually take us. It sounds like it's a futuristic dream, something out of uh, 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 the Jetsons, but um, these things can are actually going to happen. Um, in fact, there's a huge number of potential applications for RFID and NF, uh, NFC right now that we use in our everyday lives. In this lesson, we're going to learn about how radio frequency ID and near field communications work. And you're going to learn about some of the challenges that are related uh, to the implementation of such systems. So let's get started. What is RFID? Well, as we talked about in Chapter 1, uh, RFID is a technology developed to identify things in a similar way that a barcode label are used to identify almost every single thing on the grocery store shelf or products in the world today. Now, the difference between the barcode and the RFID is that the RFID uses radio frequency waves instead of laser light to read the product code. The RFID stores product information in electronic tags, which are devices that contain an antenna and an integrated circuit chip. The tags can store significantly more information than the barcode system. Uh, this data is held in a read-write or read-only memory and can include the date, time, location, and where the product was manufactured, the manufacturer's name, the product's serial number, all that. And in comparison, the barcode labels uh, typically only uh, include an item stock keeping unit number, product number, and any information about the product that has to be stored in the computer. Uh, the new technology or the RFD technology is not new. It's been in use around the world in one form or the other for many years, uh, even way back to the late 19. 30s, the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy introduced a system uh, designated the IFF, or Identification Friend or Foe, which was implemented and used for the first time in the Second World War to distinguish Allied Forces aircraft from enemy aircraft by use of special codes that can be read by a friendly aircraft at a distance. Likewise, for many years, microchips uh, and antennas Inside tiny capsules have been implement, implanted under the skin of household pets, and these tags contain a numeric code that is registered to a centralized database by the company uh, that supplies the tags. I know all my animals have those. Now, you might also be familiar with another type of RFID that's frequently used in retail stores to prevent theft. Uh, after you pay for an item, a small tag attached to the product is run through a powerful magnet at the checkout. The magnet then disables that tag, uh, preventing it from activating the alarm as you pass 
uh, near an antenna located at the store entrance. Uh, RFID system components are required to implement an RFID uh, system, uh, connect uh, it with a corporate network, enable integration with existing business software, and ultimately connect with the services that enable worldwide integration of a company's suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, and transportation providers. Um, that's called the supply chain. Now, the, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the near or the most common components required to implement an RFID system, which are the tags, the antennas, the readers, software, and the EPC Global um, network services. The RFID systems make use of product codes and data formats standardized by EPC Global. Now, the mission of the EPC Global is to make organizations more efficient by making information about any kind of product available anytime and anywhere. The standards that were published by the GS1 enable users to track products from manufacturing through to the end user and beyond. In some cases, can uh, be tracked all the way to the recycling depot or the trash heap. The electronic uh, product code or the EPC is a standard numbering scheme that can be programmed in a tag, which in turn can be attached to any physical product. Uh, think of an of a EPC as the evolution of the barcode or the UPC, which you can find today on most all the products. Each EPC is a unique number or code that is associated uh, with an individual product, uh, a case, a uh, box, or a pal, depending on how the owner or the uh, customer wishes to identify the products, so that the items can be then identified electronically. EPCs are usually represented in hexadecimal notation. Let's see if we have one here for you. Yeah. So here, uh, each EPC, is, uh, as you see, is a unique number. It's, it's this is an example of it being listed in hexadecimal notation. Uh, notation for you. Now, the EPC is either a 64 or a 96-bit long. 96-bit tags, the most common, include a header, which is an 8-bit field. A domain manager, the 28-bit field, identifies the manufacturer of the product. Um, <clears throat> right now, it's representing about 268.5 million companies. Um, the object class, uh, which is the, um, like a the SKU, the stock keeping unit, uh, can represent over 16 million different products uh, for each individual company. And the serial number, uh, this 36-bit field identifies each instance of a product and it can represent over 68.7 billion unique serial numbers. Now the nature of the 64-bit and 96-bit EPC uh, is shown here. Um, whether the manufacturer likes to use a 6496 code is dependent on the company's individual needs and that of its clients, but most tags produced today are the 96-bit version. The header field identifies uh, which EPC formats being used, and the software, uh, which we'll talk about later, reformats the tag's data so that it'll be compatible with the end user's business applications. Now, note that in this diagram, it's only intended to show that there can be different formats. It doesn't go into specific details. Uh, also, you know, these aren't drawn uh, to the correct scale because uh, of the, based on the number of bits in each field. Now, <clears throat> the RFID tags are also commonly known as what we call transponders. Now, the word is a combination of transmitter and responder, okay, kind of like modem modulation, demodulation. Now we have transponder, which is transmitter responder. Okay. Now a typical RFID tag includes an integrated circuit that contains some non-volatile memory and a simple microprocessor. Now these tags can store data that is transmitted in response to an interrogation or what we call a transmission from a reader or an integrator. Um, the device that actually captures the data by the, uh, by the RFID tags. Now there are two basic types of tags. There's a passive tag, uh, 
that are the most common type. They're small, they're produced in large quantities at low cost, they do not require battery power. Uh, they use electromagnetic energy in the RF waves transmitted by the reader's antenna to power the, the built-in chip so that it can transmit information stored in its internal memory back to the reader. The uh, animal tracking microchip implant tags are for asset management and access cards for security control doors, parking lots, for example, or maybe the fob that you use to get into your building today. Those are considered to be examples of passive tags. Okay. An active tag uh, is, is equipped with a battery uh, to power the microprocessor chip and memory. Now having their own power source means that these tags uh, can transmit a signal further away than passive tags can. However, active tags have a limited life because of the battery. Now, they're also far more expensive than passive tags, and therefore they're used to track only high-valued items, such as maybe an entire pallet or a vehicle or a shipping container. So, for example, uh, an example of an application of an active tag is to track military supplies that would be shipped around the world. They can also be used for commercial applications. Um, these active tags are also called beacons. Uh, because they can transmit on a uh, periodic basis without receiving a, any integration from a, uh, from a reader. Uh, a variation of the active tag would be something called a semi-active tag. Now, this type of tag, also called a semi-passive tag, uses a built-in battery to power the circuit only when a reader first energizes or excites or powers the tag. Now, the energy transmitted by the reader activates the tag, then uses the internal battery to power its circuits and then respond to the reader. Uh, an example of this type of tag will be um, device mounted in vehicles and used for electronic uh, uh, highway toll collection. Um, so uh, your, uh, your easy pass on your car. Uh, the batteries in the semi-active tags usually last several years given they are only used when the tag is activated by the reader's electro electromagnetic field. The size of the memory uh, in a tag varies uh, with the manufacturer and the application, but it usually between 16 bits uh, and hundreds of kilobytes. The tags are initially programmed with a unique identification code obtained uh, from APC Global. Uh, any extra memory space in the tags can be used to record historical information about the product. Uh, uh, such as health, vaccination, records of cattle, temperatures um, that a product's been exposed to uh, during shipping, using a sensor attached, uh, you know, and a built-in tag, stuff like that. Passive tags <clears throat> can be uh, produced in uh, flexible packages, uh, also called smart labels. Uh, smart labels include an adhesive backing uh, that can be attached to a box the underside of the product uh, casing, or even a pallet. Uh, smart labels can be used to track luggage in airports and trains. Uh, because they use RF, the tags are not limited to being placed in a visible area or outside, um, or in the outside packaging of, of the product. They can be read regardless of their position or orientation. Um, another type of tag called a one-bit tag, uh, they're passive devices used in some, in some retail stores. They do not contain a unique identification code, chip, or any memory. They're simply used to activate an alarm to prevent theft. Uh, these can be used uh, for anti-theft or security, but the passive tags can also be used for inventory control. Okay. I'm sure we've, uh, we've all seen these um, type of uh, tags on products that we may purchase at Lowe's or whatever. An emerging form of RFIT is chipless tags, also known as RF fibers. These tags, or chipless tags, do not contain an integrated circuit or memory. Instead, they use fibers of other types of materials that reflect a portion of the header's transmission signal back. The unique return signal can be used as an identifier. Now, these fibers are made of thin threads, fine wires, or laminates that affect the propagation of radio waves. Chipless tags are typically used in applications in which the tag needs to be hidden 
and very difficult to reproduce. One sample uh, used is the uh, card invitations used for the high-end events such as the Academy Awards. Chipless tags can be used to identify a specific paper product uh, uh, document inconspicuously, uh, which means that a uh, person handling the document is not necessarily aware that it is tagged. Chipless tags also perform better than other types of tags when attached to a metal surface or to a container or liquid. Both cans and bottles present significant problems for most RFID systems because metal surfaces can affect the propagation of radio waves and because most liquids attenuate the signal. Chipless tags uh, can be read at greater distances than a one bit or a passive tag. Next is a sensory tag. Now, as the name indicates, it can be equipped with thermal, gas, smoke, pressure, temperature, and a variety of other kinds of sensors to monitor and record environmental conditions, uh, liquid volumes, volume levels, or attempts to tamper with a product. Most sensory tags are considerably more expensive than other types of uh, passive tags. Uh, they come in larger packages and they're usually equipped with replaceable batteries that allow them to be used for longer periods of time. The cost of the tags will, will um, vary greatly depending on the type of uh, and the number of tags purchased over a period of time. In general, passive tag prices are between $0.07 cents and $0.25 cents each. Now, as technology develops and the volumes increase, RFID manufacturers and users uh, expect the cost to fall well below $0.05 cents a tag. Uh, sensory tags can cost between $25 and $100 each, each depending on the battery, uh, battery life, and the, the uh, tag capability tag capabilities. We do have a number of different classes uh, of tags as well. Uh, the class zero tags, which are not mentioned here, may still be in use in a few locations around the world, but are generally considered obsolete. The uh, class zero tag uh, communication protocols are not compatible with uh, tag classes uh, here, and not all tag classes can be mixed and used uh, in the same system. In addition to interfacing with tags, the RFID readers or integrators connect to the company's network and then transfer the data obtained from the tags to a computer. Some readers can also write data on the tags. Readers that work with passive tags also provide the energy that activates the tag. Uh, the read distance is determined by the, by the size and location of the tag and the reader's antennas, as well as the amount of power that's being transmitted. The reader specifications are generally limited by regulations in different countries that specify how much power can be transmitted in each frequency. Uh, it's important to keep <clears throat> it's important to keep international standards and regulations in mind when designing and implementing an RFID system, uh, especially when we're used they're being used to identify products worldwide. Uh, these are generally available. Uh, from the ISO and the EPC Global. The frequency ranges and common applications of RFID systems are listed here. Um, and you can see that based on your, uh, your frequency range, you'll have a different application for each. So your, your animal identification, the chip that you have in your dog, so you, you know, if he gets lost and they pick him up, they can take him to the vet, they'll scan the chip, and they'll say, oh, this belongs to so and so. Uh, here we have a, uh, an LFR, RID reader, low frequency RFID reader, uh, and it can be used to scan cattle and uh, low frequency tag applied to the uh, mock-up of the uh, cattle's ear. You can see right there. Um, the, uh, the readers come in many sizes and types as there are applications for this technology. Um, working from left to right here, we have three examples of RFID readers, each with its own antennas. Now, there is a fixed reader uh, designed to be installed at a retail store entrance, uh, a handled reader designed to be plugged into a computer's USB port, and a self-contained computer-based RFID reader uh, with tag examples. Now, in chapter four, we talked about antennas and how they're responsible for converting the radio frequency energy from the transmitter 
into electromagnetic wave. The design location of an antenna can significantly affect the range of the signal and the reliability of the communications. Now, the RFID antennas used in tags are limited in size due to the dimensions of the tag itself, and most tags are small, which allows them to be placed in a variety of different products and packages. There are two main types of tag antennas, linear and circular. Now, linear antennas offer a greater range, but they're less, but less accurate reads, and circular antennas have greater read accuracy, especially in applications in which the orientation of the antenna varies due to positioning of the product. Larger antennas allow the tags to be read at greater distances. <coughs> However, remember that the, as the frequency increases, the wavelength gets smaller and consequently so does the antenna. Higher frequency antennas can be made relatively small and still allow the tags to be read at greater distances uh, than the lower frequency tags with the same antenna size. Conversely, to detect a higher frequency signal and minimize attenuation, the, uh, the tag antenna needs to be approximately 10 to 20 microns thick. Um, lower frequency antennas can be 2 microns thick. RFID tag uh, design can be quite complex due to the antenna size and the thickness, and this can significantly affect read performances. In passive tags, the antenna uh, itself acts as the energy storage device. Uh, and here you can see some additional examples of RFID tags. Okay. Reader antennas have to be designed for the specific type of application. Now, whether the antenna uh, will be located at a retail store uh, entrance uh, for security reasons or near a warehouse shelf or on a refrigerator door, the type, size, shape, and location of the antenna are critically important to ensure good readability and accuracy. There is no typical style of RFID antenna that actually exists. The variety is huge, uh, and for many applications, their RFID antennas are custom designed and built. The type of software used in RFID implementation depends on the specific application. Nevertheless, there are three basic categories of software components. Um, we have uh, system software, middleware, and um, business application software. System software uh, is typically stored in read-only memory, or flash, uh, and is present in both the tag and the reader. It's executed by the microprocessor in each device and is used to control hardware functions. Uh, middleware is responsible for reformatting the data and the readers uh, to comply with the format required by the business applications used by the customer usually runs on a computer that is implemented as a gateway between the readers and the other data processing equipment by the end users. Uh, RFID middleware allows users to ensure that, the, that they can communicate with the RFID equipment. So keep in mind that middleware is not usually sold as prepackaged software like Microsoft Office or Adobe uh, Acrobat. Instead, each company in the business is of, uh, providing its own RFID solutions will usually write its own middleware application software or use a customizable software package provided by the manufacturer. The business application uh, software is responsible for processing orders, inventory, uh, sh shipments, invoices, and, and so on. Um, these types of applications usually rely on database software to store and manage all the transaction records in a typical business. The EPC Global Network Services, um, to use barcodes, every retail business has to record in a database the item's UPC code, or the barcode. The company's internal product number, the SKU, uh, for inventory management, uh, product description, the manufacturer's name, the price, and the quantity of items in stock. Uh, it then has to cross-reference the barcode with the SKU 
uh, so that this information can be accessed by the barcode readers at the cash register. With RFID, because the EPC already contains a reference to the manufacturer along with the product code, the need for manually entering data for cross-referencing is reduced. The potential for human beings being uh, introducing errors uh, when manually entering the information into the database is less likely as well. <clears throat> The manufacturer name is used to reorder products when the stock is low or depleted. Uh, with EPCs, companies are able to acquire the manufacturer's name over the internet using a uh, service from EPC Global uh, named Object Name Service or ONS. Uh, it was modeled after the internet's uh, domain name system or DNS. The ONS is a, a mechanism for discovering uh, information about a product and related services. When a reader gets the EPC from a tag, passes it to the company's servers, which sends its ONS via the internet, upon identifying the manufacturer, ONS responds from the URL of the internet where the product uh, information is stored. The company servers can then retrieve all that information about that particular product and then can use it for additional data processing. Eventually, trillions of products from millions of companies will likely be included in the ONS database. Like DNS, ONS is a worldwide distributed database. An additional component uh, that enables companies around the world to exchange information regarding their trade transactions is EPC information uh, services. Now, similar to the, to the electronic data uh, interchange, the specification that many large companies uh, used to complete paperless transactions, the EPCIS will eventually enable large organizations to purchase, invoice, and track products over the internet, eliminating the need to send paper documents by mail or fax. So here you can see there's like five fundamental components of an EPC global RFID system, the tags, the readers, the middleware, the business applications, the EPC uh, global services, and then how they are logically all connected. Now, describing how the different RFID tag readers work would require its own stinking class and book. Now, given that these devices use different transmission techniques in each frequency band, now we're going to talk about the uh, technical details on how two of the most common types of passive tags from readers transmit and communicate with each other at the PHY and MAC layers. So we have the UHF, the 400 to 900 uh, megahertz, and the HF, 13.56 megahertz. Now, a passive tag is the most common type. Uh, it transmits uh, only when it receives a signal from the reader. The connection uh, between a tag and a reader is called a coupling. Now, the RFID primarily uses two types of coupling, uh, depending on the application. We have an inductive or magnetic coupling. This type is designed for tags with either that either touch the surface of the antenna or insert it in a slot in the reader's case. Uh, in these systems, the tags are typically used at a maximum distance of about a half an inch uh, from the antenna. The basic difference between inductive and magnetic coupling is really the shape of the antenna. Uh, backscatter coupling, this type is designed for tags that can be read at distances greater than 3.3 feet or um, a meter all the way up to 330 feet uh, in some cases. It's a reflection of radiation. Uh, so if we remember that passive tags are powered by an RF signal sent by the reader. Now after the reader transmits the data, uh, the reader trans, uh, transmission itself supplies power to the tag so it can then receive it receive and decode the reader transmission, okay? So after the reader transmits the data, it then begins to transmit a continuous wave, which is un, an unmodulated sine wave. Now this continuous wave is captured by the passives, uh, passive tag's antenna, and the tag uses the energy from the continuous wave to supply power to the chip so that the tag can respond to the integrator. And the tag essentially reproduces the same wave it receives from the reader. 
but it modulates the, the, the signal with the data by changing the electrical properties and consequently the reflection coefficient of its own antenna. Now this means that the antenna will transmit with more or less power affecting the amplitude and the signal detected. Backscatter modulation is based on variations of, of the ASK, the amplitude shift keying, or a combination of ASK and phase shift keying, both of which we talked about in chapter two. Now, the data is also digitally encoded to ensure that there will be enough transitions between zero and one and vice versa to assist devices in maintaining synchronization. The reader has a separate transmitter and receiver circuits and antennas. And because it is a power device, it transmits a much stronger or higher amplitude signal than TAC in order to detect a modulated signal from the TAC. The receiver in the reader compares its own CW signal with the backscatter. The difference between the two is the data being sent by the tag. Now both the both the reader and the tag modulate the signal in amplitude by as much as a hundred percent or by as little as ten percent. Now the ten percent modulation is more sensitive to interference and noise, but the signal can travel farther. One hundred percent modulation is easier for the reader to detect but during the periods without CW, the tags are not being powered, so the distance between tag and reader must be significantly reduced. So in practice, the signal is modulated somewhere between 10% and 100%, given that neither of the extremes is very usable. The modulated signal is a result of, of, um, of the amount of power generated by the reader and the size of the antenna. Now here you, you can see a signal modulated at 10% and one modulated at 100%. Note that the signals here are not drawn to scale um, in amplitude or in frequency. Communications be, uh, between tag and reader are always going to be half duplex. The integrators and tags do not transmit and receive data simultaneously. Now to prevent interference issues uh, from affecting the reliability of RFID systems, and to allow for environments in which multiple readers are installed in the same area, also called uh, dense integrator environments. The EPC global standards also specify the use of frequency hopping spread spectrum and then direct uh, uh, sequence spread spectrum transmissions. The latter of the systems are generally only used for advanced active tag. The HFRID passive tag uh, communication uses a protocol called slotted terminating adaptive uh, collection or stack in which the tags re reply within randomly selected positions or time intervals referred to as slots which are the uh, reply intervals used in the stack protocol. Now the integrator transmits signals to work uh, or should say to mark the beginning and end of each slot, depending on the amount of the data that's being requested by each tag. So note here that the slots are not equal in size. The figure is obviously not the scale, but the number of slots is regulated by the integrator and is always a, a power of two. Now, some shorter slots may exist when there is no reply uh, from any tags, in which case the integrator terminates a slot. Now the maximum number of slots available is 512. The stack protocol is used to prevent tag collisions in HF and it is described uh, uh, further in, in the section called uh, tag collision handling in HF. Now note that slot F is always present and signals the beginning of the reply interval. Slot, um, Slot, is the, slot F is also the only one that is fixed in size. It also ends automatically, meaning that the integrator does not signal the end of slot F. UHF readers today support what is called Generation 2 or Gen 2 protocols. Gen 1 protocols might still be used for, ta uh, for tags and readers, but support for Gen 1 is quickly being discontinued. Gen 2 protocols define three techniques for communication between tags and readers. 
Uh, in the first, a reader can select tag by transmitting a bit mask uh, that isolates a tag or a group of tags. Uh, the bit mask works with, uh, or very similarly to the way network masks work for your IP addressing by isolating the subnets. In the second technique, a reader can inventory tags by isolating them using a repetitive process. Um, in, in the third, which we're going to talk about later, and in the third technique, uh, one, once the EPC for a particular tag is known to the system, the reader can alternatively access each tag individually. Gen 2 readers can transmit with a lot more power and UHS systems are designed to work at a greater distance than HF systems. Now, when an integrator initiates communication in an RFID system, there has to be a way to prevent every tag within range of the reader's signal from responding at the same time. Now, the tag identification layer defines three methods that allow integrators to manage the population of tags within reach of its signal. Select, um, inventory, and access. With the select method, an integrator sends a series of commands to select a particular segment of the population of tags within its reach. Now this is done in preparation in preparation for an inventory or for the purpose of accessing a specific tag. Now the selection is based on user specified criteria such as a particular category of product from one manufacturer. Tags do not respond to these commands. They simply set internal flags or bits for responding to ladder transmissions. In UHF, the inventory method uh, and integrated with the inventory method and integrator sends out a series of query commands to get information from one tag at a time. Now, as each tag receives an acknowledgement from the integrator, it'll then reset the inventory flag and does not respond to further inventory commands uh, in the same round. In HF, the integrator simply waits for each tag to reply in a different slot. With the access method, the integrator sends one or more commands to multiple tags or exchanges data with a single tag at a time after uniquely identifying the tag with a particular command. The minimum amount of information contained in a tag's memory is the um, is the e, is the EPC. It's a 16-bit uh, cyclic redundancy check or CRC, uh, and destroy password. Now, a destroy password a destroy password is a code programmed into the tag during manufacturing. After the destroy password is transmitted by the reader, the tag is permanently disabled, disabled and can never be read or written to again. This tag information is pretty much is shown here. With a potentially very large population of tags, all tags could respond to a reader at the same time, which would then cause collisions, right? So depending on whether each product is tagged or not, whether it be in warehouses or boxes of house, whatever, this would result in collisions and would prevent the reader from identifying individual tags. So the LF tags and readers do not support any collision handling mechanisms. Therefore, LF systems can only read one tag at a time. This is not an issue when the application is reading an access card uh, for opening a door or reading a cattle's, uh, cattle's tags or whatever. However, for RFID to work in a warehouse or in a store or maybe inside your refrigerator, the ability to read multiple tags is required, hence the use of the following tag anti-collision mechanisms. Now, because the reader initially might not know which tags are present within the range of its signal, and because new tags could enter the reader's signal field from time to time, the reader can send a verify ID command. However, if you consider how shelves in a store or warehouse are typically organized, the tags within a certain reader's field 
uh, belong to certain groups of products. And all tags in the reader's field that are intended recipients of the verification command are going to reply with their own EPC. If a reader can identify at least one of these tags, it can proceed to select a range of tags by sending a series of commands and instruct the tags about an upcoming inventory. The process repeats until the reader has identified every group of tags within a range of its signal. The reader can also uh, tell a tag or a group of tags to be quiet by sending a special command. This selection process can be compared to a teacher that meets uh, his class for the first time at the beginning of a semester and does not have a list with the names of all the students to identify each student. The teacher might begin by asking all the students to call out their full names. Initially, several students might reply at the same time. The teacher then has to ask the students who last names begin with the letter A to call out their names. Again, she might also get more than one reply at the same time. Next, the teacher can then request that only students whose last names begin with the letters AA call out their names. This time, the chance of getting multiple uh, simultaneous replies will be a lot smaller. By repeating this process and refining the query, uh, eventually the reader will have enough information to be able to communicate with all the tags in the group, then sends a command to an entire group to set an inventory flag. The next command uh, instructs the tags that the reader will begin uh, an inventory round. During the inventory round, the reader sends uh, an inquiry to each individual tag. And then once a tag is replied to an inventory query, it resets its inventory flag and does not reply again until the reader announces the next inventory round. In HF systems, the reader selects groups of tags based on the stack protocol. And each tag uses the TPC, CRC, and destroy password to calculate a number that becomes the slot number in which each particular tag will reply. The calculation uses the parameters that we, we talked about along with random number generators for each tag. The reader then begins an inventory round and waits for each tag to reply in its own time slot, which then will prevent a collision. The ISO standard assumes that the number of potential collisions in these cases will be less than 0.1%. Now, if a collision does occur, thereby preventing the inventory process from finishing correctly, the reader selects a smaller group of tags using the process described earlier. Um, under the HF tag communication, and then we'll repeat that inventory process again. Now, reader collisions can also happen in dense reader environments. If a reader does not receive any replies, it assumes that reader collisions occurred. This means that the tags could not understand the last reader transmission. And then it'll back off for a random period of time. Uh, before listening for network traffic and attempting to transmit again. The RFID, RFID MAC layer is responsible for establishing and communicating the transmission parameters, such as the uh, transmission bit rate, the modulation type, the operating frequency range, uh, and the frequency hop channel sequence uh, that would be used for communications at the PHY layer. Now, the reader sends commands to the tags establishing the communication parameters for each communication session. Now, as we talked about earlier, the amount of data stored in a typical passive RFID tag is relatively small. The lack of power uh, supply along with, the, along with uh, low processing power, both of which help keep the tag uh, cost low, means that the resulting data transmission rates for the tags are also low. Now, some of the EPC global standards specify a minimum number of tags per second that a reader should be able to access rather than a specific data rate. Now, the specifications for HF tag call, the, uh, call for readers to be capable of reading 200 tags a second. Uh, for tasks containing uh, just an EPC, the actual rates will likely be between 500 to 800 tags per second. 
Now, the UHF specifications define the tag to reader data rate as twice that of the reader to tag rate. So in North America, the allowed tag to reader data rate can be up to 140.35K per second. In Europe, due to the RF signal power limitations, the maximum data rate is up to 30K. Conversely, uh, the reader to tag data rates are 70.18K in North America and 15K in Europe. The Gen 2 protocol uh, specifications support much faster tag isolation. Now, now that we have a pretty good understanding of what RFID is, it's time to find out about near-field communication. Near-field communication, or NFC, we talked about way back in Chapter 1, is a technology that provides short-range wireless connectivity between devices such as smartphones and tablet computers. NFC is based on the ISO uh, uh, 18092 RFID technology standard and the 21481, also called the NFC IP2. Uh, it was prepared by the, uh, the ECMA International, a uh, non-for-profit or not-for-profit not standardization organization. The, uh, the ECMA, the ECMA International, was originally called the, Euro called, um, the European Computer Manufacturers Association. Uh, the NFC requires little or no configuration by users, uh, and devices connect automatically as soon as they are brought within a minimum of 1.6 inches. Uh, this technology is available or is able to transfer data between devices um, or read passive NFC tags at rates of between 106 to 424k per second. Um, it originated from it from and is compatible with the uh, the uh, FBLICA, which is a smart card protocol uh, created by Sony, and it's used in parts of Asia in the MyFair protocol developed by Philips. Uh, both protocols were designed for payment systems. The NFC Forum, uh, founded in 2004 by Nokia, Philips, and Sony, created a set of uh, specifications that builds on HF uh, RFID and then also enables contactless two-way data transfer between two power devices uh, beyond the typical one-way communication that happens between a smart card and a reader. Uh, NFC can be used with a handheld device or a card for the for uh, many purposes. Um, listed here are probably some of the more popular ones. I'm a huge fan of um, of using my uh, my phone for uh, to pay. So for me, I'm a big fan of the Google Pay, uh, which would be like Apple Pay for some of you. The different modes uh, that we have uh, one uh, many different uh, models of Android smartphones, tablets today are NFC capable and are typically equipped with a low power integrator uh, that can read tags. Now, some Android devices, such as the Google Nexus tablets, are also able to write to NFC tags. The Apple iPhone 6 and newer models require an NFC compatible SIM card uh, to enable the use of Apple Pay. The technology uses an inductive coupling. Uh, between uh, two loop antennas, and an NFC capable device can operate in listen mode, poll mode, read writer mode, card emulator mode, initiator mode, and target mode. The initiator and target modes are unique characteristics of NFC uh, that differentiates it from an RFID uh, in the sense that the NFC capable device is able to exchange uh, many different uh, types of information with other. NFC uh, capable uh, devices. The RFID, on the other hand, is limited to communication between the readers and tags. The NFC specifications uh, currently define four types of tags. Uh, each type of tag is designed for a different purpose and has slightly different capabilities, including the amount of memory. Different tag types also communicate using a slightly different frame formats at different speeds and use different types of encoding, NRZ, NRZ1, etc. NRZ, if you remember, is the, uh, the non-return to zero 
uh, if we're looking at our wavelength. Um, the different uh, synchronization and modulation methods, um, thus the first thing an NSC cable device in pull mode needs to do is identify the type of tags or devices that are within range of its magnetic field. Now, some tags can be written to uh, written to only once. Uh, others can be protected by a password so that they cannot be written to again unless they are then unlocked. The memory on the tag can be used to store URLs, uh, business cards, pictures, brochures, PDF files, etc. You know this makes NFC far more flexible. Um, useful and accurate than the quick response or QR codes uh, that a lot of people use today. And depending on the type, NFC tags can store anywhere from 48 bytes to 32K of information. Virtually everyone can purchase NFC tags in the right type uh, of app loaded on their phones or tablets. Uh, might be able to program the tags using a smartphone or, uh, or a tablet. Uh, you can find out uh, a lot more information about NFC tags at uh, kimtag.com. Um, if you want to, you know, uh, purchase one, I had a, um, I was at the, the pool store uh, the other week, and the uh, the owner found out that I did uh, IT for a living, and she was so excited to give me her business card. And she's, and I'm looking at it, and all I just have a pool store on it. I'm like, well, this doesn't really give me a whole lot of information. And then she asked me to uh, tap my phone to it. And when I did, she had created her own NFC t um, capable business card. And it took me to their pool's website with all the information that, uh, that I needed to understand about their company. So it was pretty cool. Um, okay, so NFC cable devices can transmit at 13.56 megahertz unlicensed uh, frequency band uh, and they can modulate the signal using an ASK or a combination of ASK and PSK over a range of about 17 to 14 kilohertz. Uh, modulation varies between 10% and 100% depending on the type of tag. The digital signal is encoded using a uh, method similar to the return to zero um, technique, uh, which provides enough signal transitions to help ensure good synchronization between the wireless devices and between the devices and the tags themselves. Uh, transfer data uh, between two smartphones or two or tablet computers. The NFC employs the data exchange protocol. Um, a DEP message consists of one or more records. Each record is then encapsulated. It's an RF frame that contains a header and a payload. The header includes, includes the identifier with uh, the length and the type. <clears throat> the identifier is used to define the type of payload. The length uh, can be up, up to one octet long for short records but it's normally four octets long. Uh, payload length of zero is used to indicate an empty message. And the type, this field indicates that what type of data is being carried within the payload and will be received by the receiving device to decide which application will process the data. So for example, pictures are automatically stored in the, uh, the photo app and URLs are sent to the browser app. Uh, on the receiving device. An error is generated if the device cannot support the data type um, uh, specified in the field. Now, it's easy to imagine a thousand other applications for RFID and that have the potential for making life uh, and business easier, safer, and simpler. However, the technology does face a whole bunch of challenges. Um, one of the major challenges for the implementation of RFID uh, systems is the impact uh, of the volume of data of a company's network. Uh, with manual or barcode based inventory control systems, the, the amount of data that is collected and transmitted across a company's network is usually limited to the on-hand quantities 
a particular product along with the UPC code for each product. However, RFID systems are usually implemented so that the inventory can be counted by simply activating the reader. To ensure that the shelves in a large retail store are always fully stocked with products. The system again can then direct the readers to in interrogate all the RFID tags every five minutes or so. Then scanning can add a lot of specific traffic to the organization's network, which would be an issue. Now to get a sense of the amount of increased traffic on a company's network, consider a scenario in which a large national retailer tags each of the 10,000 individual items in each of its 1,000 stores, and then interrogates all the readers from a central head office location every 15 minutes. At 17 bytes per EPC code alone, remember that with the 96-bit EPC, the minimum information with a tag is about 136 bytes. Okay, so at 17 bytes per EPC code alone, this would generate 170 meg of data from a single read. And it would, so it would basically fill a CD-ROM in one hour and create 5.4 gig of network traffic in a typical eight hour business day. In only one month, the total volume of traffic would swell to about 1.6 terabytes of data. Now, although most of this data would be processed and duplicate data would then be discarded, you're still talking about a significant increase in the volume of data running through your company's network, which would need to be um, dealt with. Uh, now assume that a system is eventually implemented and that a, a company relies on it to replenish inventory automatically. In this case, network availability becomes a serious factor in the store's ability to serve its customers. Now, as retailers become dependent on RFID systems to enhance service and reduce costs, greater network bandwidth has to become available. So the retailer's network must also be reliable. That is, it must remain functional. Now, remember that 99% availability means that the network is expected to be down for about 80 hours a week, which is usually an unacceptable amount. That's why we always go by the five nines. Okay. Any, any downtime that occurs during business hours can quickly become a serious problem. And for most companies, these demands will translate to expanding the adding redundant, expanding and then adding additional redundant equipment. So large banks and corporations already are saddled with archiving tremendous amounts of historical data, potentially tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of terabytes of data for each company. In addition, new laws designed to protect consumers and investors, such as the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, require companies to accumulate uh, and securely store even more information, in some cases indefinitely. Huge volume of data uh, that can be generated with RFID systems significantly increases the need to store information accurately uh, and reliability. So even without RFID in place, businesses are finding it a challenge to uh, to manage the huge numbers of devices on their networks. Network management software does not come at a low price, even for small networks with fewer than say a thousand devices. The cost of network management software can easily escalate to well over half a million dollars. And as networks expand, the need to remotely monitor and manage servers, routers, switches, and RFID readers, uh, all from a central location, uh, becomes a critical factor in the company's ability to ensure network availability. <clears throat> Add to this the task of having to manage uh, and tracking hundreds, thousands, or even millions of RFID tags, and you can imagine the security issues related to wireless RFID transmissions. Managing RFID systems can quickly become a much more complex and costly uh, job. So then we got to secure it all. Uh, the growth of RFID and the development of the relevant worldwide standards have given rise to a large number of security and privacy concerns. And so there's solutions for RFID related security issues, but they're not perfect fixes. They're, they're still always going to be challenges. 
let's look at it this way. So, for example, the growth of uh, with the growth of NF NFC still being driven by its application as an electronic wallet that can be used in place of credit and debit cards, as well as uh, as by its applications in public transportation, tickets, passwords, uh, and so on. And concerns from users are increasing. Recent developments in multi-core processors will no doubt enable the use of more sophisticated encryption, uh, and that can help ensure the security and privacy of device users. NFC transmissions are harder to interfere with or capture due to the fact that there's short distances between devices. Nevertheless, it is theoretically possible to access information from either smartphone or tablet if you've got a reader that's sensitive enough to capture the information from a greater distance. It's also possible to read information from a TAG or RFID NFC enabled credit card, but financial organizations would not allow these systems uh, to be used by their customers unless there were enough security mechanisms in place to prevent financial loss. Ultimately, it is financial organizations and the real retailers that have to absorb any losses uh, that might result from someone stealing your credit card number or name. Debit and credit card agreements clearly state that customers are not responsible for charges on their card uh, if information is stolen. Uh, in the United States, some of the concerns about RFID are centered on privacy, tag data, um, <clears throat> uh, used for product, uh, used for product after it's purchased could be linked to the consumer and used for t uh, target marketing. Uh, businesses could collect that data about a person's purchase and use it for a number of applications that will potentially interfere with the customer's privacy. Uh, this is not that different from data being captured uh, for the use of debit cards or credit cards. Um, however, to associate this data with a particular person would require obtaining information from debit and credit cards or by following the user home. Most of the privacy concerns that people have regarding RFID are due to not having enough information about the technology. Security related to RFID readers falls under the Wired Network Security Policy. Uh, reader to tag and tag reader communications have the same vulnerabilities as any wireless network. The only exception being that capturing the tag to reader communications can be very difficult. Uh, tag transmissions occur at very low power levels. Readers are also transmitting a CW uh, during tag to reader communications. So once a tag is installed on a product packaging, usually cannot be removed without permanently damaging the tag. However, it is possible to tamper with the data in a class one by recording over the existing data or by adding new data. Powering a mobile uh, reader capable of emitting a high power signal would require heavy batteries. This could be done from inside a vehicle, but then the mobility of the reader would be severely limited. Most passive tags uh, do not support authorization or encryption uh, security methods, but they do lack their own power supply. Uh, they use chips uh, with low processing power and are low in cost. Uh, shielding stores and uh, stores, shielding the stores and warehouses to prevent RF signals from coming in or going out might solve some of the problems associated with the unauthorized access from outside the building but that can be a very expensive proposition. In addition, once customers take the products to their homes or workplaces, someone using an integrator nearby could still expose them to privacy violation. Data in the tags themselves can be locked and require a password for the tag to be used again. So by using a combination of the EPC CRC and the built-in destroy password, Tags can also be permanently disabled. Locking the tags would make it very difficult to use the information from the tag throughout the distribution channels. Permanently destroying the tag, either by issuing a kill command or by physically damaging it, would prevent the retailer from using the tag again if the customer returned the product, limiting the functionality of the RFID system. Physically destroying tags would also prevent customers from taking advantage of features like the smart refrigerator application that we talked about 
uh, at the beginning of our lesson. A blocker tag uh, is a device that can be used to simulate the presence of a virtually infinite number of tags. Blocker tags can be used to disable unauthorized readers from accessing the information from a selected group of tags by sending so many responses that an unauthorized reader not differentiate between the blocker tag and the legitimate tag. Uh, they also offer an alternative solution that minimizes some of the issues described earlier and as much at a much lower cost. And after getting um, your purchase home, the consumer then can optionally destroy the blocker tag so he can continue to uh, use legitimate tags, say in their refrigerator. Now, security for RF, RFID and NFC is a, um, a complex topic, and there is no single solution that addresses all possible um, situations. Uh, applications of RFID and NFC far outweigh the potential problems. However, RFID and NFC uh, usage will continue to expand, and eventually these technologies will uh, be present in nearly every aspect of our lives. Um, so educating users and implementing legislation uh, related to data collection and privacy is going to play a, a huge part in raising uh, the comfort level of your customers with the technology. Um, as with pretty much everything that we do in our industry. Uh, that is it for us today. Uh, we covered a lot of information. Uh, this is uh, also one of my uh, one of my more favorite chapters, mainly because of uh, how uh, I we all use this uh, technology. Uh, I'm a big fan of um, of uh, tap and tap and go with my phone uh, because, especially right now with the uh, with the current situation in our global health health market. Uh, I don't want to be touching things and pushing buttons and touching products that other people have touched. So I take, like to just use my phone and be in and out. Uh, so knowing that um, knowing that the uh, technology that we have is secure uh, and how it works adds a bit more comfort uh, to what it is that we do every day.